You're listening to the Plane Talking UK podcast, the UK-based podcast written by a passenger for anyone. And here are your hosts, Carlos Stevings, Matt Smith and Neville Bounds. Well, hello and welcome to episode number 203 of the Plane Talking UK podcast. I'm Carl Stebbings and joining me, as always, in the barn studio this week is my co-host Matt Smith. Matt, and how are you? I'm very well, thank you very much. Yes, yes, all good. It's uh, been a busy old time here in the barn. It certainly has <laughs> been a busy time. We've had uh, quite a lengthy pre-show, that it's yes. uh, safe to say. Uh, before the show, which has been quite entertaining, I think, for everyone who's joined us in the chat room. okay. (laughs) And also joining us uh, this week, as always, is the other awesome part of the PTUK team. It's uh, Sir Neville Bounds. Yes, good afternoon, morning or evening, depending on where you are. I hope everybody is well. And uh, It was yes. morning here, it's now afternoon, but anyway. Yes, <laughs> right, yes, we have had a slight delay, but that's okay, that's all right. Um, but uh, no, looking forward to another great show and hope everybody's doing well. Uh, a bit cold uh, over here in Buckinghamshire, I think it's the same where you are, guys, as well, isn't it? It's a bit chilly. Yeah, and not, chilly. Not really nice yeah, weather, the, but, the light's uh, on in the car, that's ne- that's always a good, you know, sort of yes, an indication as to it. how cold it is when the, the little light not, on not the Not the dash- red light. Uh, no, 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 it's only no, the amber okay. one, just sort of, you know, warning you right. that there might be some mm. issues. Yeah. So you've, uh, you've had a bit of a busy week this week, haven't you? Have you been flying around with, uh, with BA? Yes, um, went out on Sunday of last week, uh, which was to the Integrated Systems Europe show uh, 2018 in Amsterdam. It's our annual show that we go to. We've got lots of meetings there, lots of stuff, lots of dinners and adult beverages as well which was good so i'm feeling a little bit uh, jaded as i flew back yesterday uh, but had a great week but just very tiring on, on the feet from for most of the week that was all but uh, back to normality this coming week hopefully sounds good sounds good so we have got loads to get through in the show this week uh, we've got um, there's some great news stories and we've also got a awesome segment uh, from uh, nev for the nev's passenger experience uh, segment but uh, we're not going to divulge who it's with this week. But it's safe to say, well, uh, she's a bit of a Miss World, I think, uh, we'll say, Nev. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, you know, we've already done the, the, the Mel C uh, interview <laughs> over Christmas, and that's uh, set, set the bar quite high, quite we high, think. Yes. But uh, mm. th- this time, I think we've uh, even exceeded that, I would say. <laughs> So we've got uh, a bit of housework to do at the top of the show, and uh, it's something we do uh, at the beginning of the month normally uh, to uh, to thank all our very, very generous people who donate to the show each week. So, Nev, hand it over to you. Yes, thank you very much to everybody for your fantastic donations. And they are Adrian Meacham, Nick Anderson, Captain Jeff, Stephanie Plummer, Stuart Black, Liz Piper, Jonathan Warner, Evan Shu, Adam Spink, Matt Donemeyer, Jeff Ward, Ben Todd, York Mola, Philip Labe, Andrew Wilson, Graham Haley, Matt Caton, David Humphreys, Eric Graves, Jordan Rose, Steve Andress, Matt Bunting Frame, Myla, Ryan Harper, Stuart Backer, and Ray Williams. Many thanks to all of you for your superb donations. Yeah, and don't forget, if you want to donate to the show, if you've got a spare few pence laying behind the sofa, uh, we really, really do appreciate all the donations to the show. They help to run the show and help to uh, to to give more technical uh, stuff uh, for Matt to play around with during the show. Uh, if you want to uh, donate to the show, you can do that via the website, uh, plaintalkinguk.com. There's a link on there. Patreons, you can click on there, or you can also donate via the uh, the original way, which is by PayPal through the link on the website as well, and donate a few pence to the show, which always helps to uh, well to, to push things along nicely. But uh, no thanks for everyone uh, for donating to the show. We really do appreciate it, and uh, we've got lots of things planned for this year uh, with various air shows and uh, some meetups as well. We've got planned as well for later on in the summertime, which we've got uh, you know, we're in the can or in the bag ready to go so uh, yep thanks everyone for that so we are going to say as well a big uh, hello to everyone who's joined us in the live chat room today loads of people in there we've got uh, Liz Piper Dr. Steph Shorty Crossgroves in there Liz Piper uh, Captain Nick is in the chat room we've got Andreas Norden in the chat room as well uh, who supplied us with these rather fancy badges here. Yeah. Uh, we've got Falco, uh, we've got uh, Philip Davis, uh, let me just grab the list here in case I miss anyone, uh, Andrew Wilson, uh, Jen Niffer, um, Flipsy is also in the chat room, 
Uh, name I haven't seen before. First Officer Mike, Andrew Wilson. I don't think I missed anyone else. If I have, I'm honestly sorry. But uh, thanks for everyone for joining us in the live chat room tonight. I think we, we can stop the uh, Patreon music now. Which is it's, it's playing up, it's I good. think it's, to, it's fair to say. <laughs> it's going it's, really it's, well. There yeah. we go. We'll do that. Yeah. There we go. Let's stop now. So uh, we are going to start the show, as we do each week then, with our rundown of the weekly news from around the world and the UK. So if you're ready, Matt. Always born ready. Yeah. And if you're ready, Nev. I'm about the only person that is, I think. But okay. Yes, I'm rude. Ready. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> So, kicking off this week's first news story, this one's on the independent.co.uk website. The headline is, Airline Blames Passengers After Door Falls Off Plane During Landing. Something you not really want to happen when you're on an aircraft. (laughs) So, uh, the story then is, uh, this one is, a Nigerian airline has blamed passengers. Do you know, I thought you said Nigel there. No, no, not Nigel. (laughs) A Nigerian airline has blamed passengers after a plane door fell off shortly after landing. The Dana, or Dana Air, have you want to pronounce that, flight from Lagos. We uh, probably should get definition of of Dana. Dana, Because I feel a bit bad like I'm naming an (laughs) APG host every time we discuss it. So, uh, the Dana or Dana Air flight from Lagos, which is one of Captain Nick's favourite destinations, is it? Uh, right. was taxiing on the runway at Abdur Airport when the emergency exit door fell off. Passengers <laughs> told of hearing rattling throughout the flight and described what's, uh, what's happening as scary. The airline insisted there was no way the door could have fallen off without a passenger making a conscious effort to open it. But passengers uh, said everything on board uh, was okay and that, uh, well, the passenger must have, well, had something to do with the door itself. Right. Uh, Dapo Sanwo from Lagos told the BBC the flight was noisy with vibrations from the door and he noticed the emergency door latch was loose and dangling. When they landed, the plane was taxiing uh, back to the parking area and we heard a poof-like explosion How followed by a surge of breeze. You don't get away with that. How noise. did it go again? A poof. <laughs> right, OK. Uh, <laughs> and uh, he added the cabin crew tried to say that passengers had pulled a hatch while everyone denied this. They also tried to get us to stop taking videos or pictures. Another passenger, Ola Brown, a doctor from Lagos, said the door was unstable throughout the flight, she said. As we touched down, it fell off, she said, and it was scary stuff. In a statement, Dana Air, Dana Air, whatever you want to call it, categorically uh, said that this could never have happened without an effort or conscious effort by a passenger to open the door. When the aircraft is airborne, it's fully pressurised and there was no way the seat or door could have been shaking as insinuated. The airline said its engineers and the Nigerian Civil Aviation Authority inspected the plane upon landing and found there was no issue and no threat to safety at any point. It added the aircraft later made the return flight to Lagos. Are they, Dana looking, Air, are they looking at a different picture to the one <laughs> I'm seeing? Dana Air's licence was suspended in 2012 and again in 2013 after two deadly crashes. It resumed flying again in January 2014. So, Matt, you, pro- you popped the pictures up there on the screen. Now, this is the overwing exit seat, which um, I think most of us have sat there to at one point in time. And it's generally a case of two handles, one at the, one at the top, one at the bottom of the door, and you pull them down towards the uh, the window as such, and uh, the, the window can pop out. Mm. But um, I, d- I doubt whether the person sitting in that seat really wanted the window to fall or the door to fall out I mean, there's, there's, the there's many issues that I have with this story and uh, one of which is uh, I mean I, I get that you can't always re- necessarily rely if you like on, on uh, individuals and uh, you know the members of the public because let's be honest they, they, they are rather br- Ooh, hello, having issues in I'm having a microphone issue don't mind me um, you know there are issues with, with um, people perhaps not telling the truth but I mean th- th- that photograph don't look great does it with now the, if you remember a few weeks back Matt, we had that story with the Ryanair flight where the uh, the guy couldn't wait to get back to the gate, so he popped the over. He was quite keen, yes. Yeah, he, yep. he took the door out and got out on the wing and, um, yeah, and yeah, had a wander. Had a wander. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, this is obviously a mad dog. I think this particular aircraft in question uh, is one of uh, one of Captain Jeff's favourite aircraft, the mad dogs. Right. But uh, yeah, what do you think, Nev? Interesting, isn't it, that the, um, the slogan below the on, on the fuselage on the outside says, Dana Air, the smartest <laughs> way to fly. Well... <laughs> 
clear, clear not. Is it know? just is it just my my <laughs> issue? Do you think? I mean, because that looks that picture. I'm going to pop it back up because it actually looks like it's been um, fiddled with. Can you see oh, what uh, I mean? Uh, the, the writing has been fiddled yes. with. Oh, okay. Sorry, that's me just turning the volume up. Is it right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, yeah. What, what do you mean? In what way does it look? Like well, no, because it with? looks like it looks like the writing is not part of the original photograph. No, no, no. That is that is yeah. That is their livery. Yeah. No, I, yeah. Don't panic. Oh, okay. All no, right. that is okay. it. But I see what you mean. Yeah, it does look as if it's been superimposed yeah, onto indeed. the. Um... You know, kind of like we like like <laughs> Captain Al did to your TriStar <laughs> yeah. van. He put Airbus written all over it. Yeah, yeah. that same sort of. Actually, feel I think to Nev it. had one done of him uh, oh, in, the, in the last few weeks. He never was someone had put uh, Nev. Air, Somebody been think, interfering uh, with the banana. With Air Force oh, Nev right. Force yes. One. So there's been all sorts of stuff going on, um, only, only some of which I can talk about. Uh, oh. But, um, yes, it was. Uh, <laughs> oh. Had all sorts of uh, things uh, put, yes. put on my uh, what my. Would have been my aircraft, as it were. But, uh, right. Okay. No. Uh, um, quick I think on. this <laughs> is uh, one of those stories which. Um, there we go. How's that? There's Hop just some. There. Uh, there's probably sort of some exaggeration going on here as well, and uh, again a bit of sensationalism uh, with the story. Mm. Are, are you suggesting that the that the that uh, the Independent may not necessarily be reporting 100% accurate, pu- you know, public information here? I, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying I don't <laughs> normally go to that uh, media outlet for my <laughs> for my aviation. <laughs> Nev's more of a, a star or a sun man. Oh right. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yes, which, who are obviously very famous for. Oh yeah. Uh, Yes. Of course. Anyway. Anyway, moving on to the next story, <laughs> okay, Matt, yeah. this one, a uh, special one for you as always, but it's a good news story if you're a passenger. Right, yes, okay. So this is on the Bristol Post, and the headline is Ryanair to make a big change to flight compensation rules. Mm. Uh, changes are being ma- Oh dear, I do hate pop-ups. Why is it about adverts? Mm. Changes are being made to Ryanair's compensation time frame, which will benefit many passengers. The low-cost co- airline plans to cap its compensation time frame for delays and cancellations to just 10 days. This means from the 1st of April, its claims team will be able to, make, to pay any valid claims under the EU 261 flight delay in just under two weeks instead of the current 28 days maximum. It comes just four months after boss boss Michael O'Leary was forced to cancel 20,000 flights due to botched pilot rotors in a move that disrupted thousands of passengers' plans and led to it being ranked the worst budget airline as reported in the Mirror. Oh, well, that must be true then, if the Mirror reported it. What's changing? Well, Ryanair announced its intention to speed up compensation payments as part of its always getting better plan. Under EU Rule 261-2004, if you're delayed by more than three hours or your flights cancelled you could be entitled to between 110 and 530 pounds in money back although this has been set in euros uh, if you travel yes in other words it's going to go down <laughs> it's the way things uh-huh, are going yeah. at the moment uh, if you travel with Ryanair and experience a delay from the 1st of April they'll clear it up within 10 days the airline which uh, reformed its cabin policy uh, earlier this month has also promised 90% of its flights in the next year will be on time and that its flights will be plastic-free within five years. What does that mean? Plastic They're going to reduce free. the amount of plastic used on board the aircraft. A lot oh, of okay. airlines oh, do. Oh, very it, cool. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I thought it was like, you know, you, ha- you only had to pay in cash or something. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> just like, anyway. uh, Ryanair's chief marketing officer, oh, we do love a statement from Kenny Jacobs, mm. said, we are promising today that we will pay and valid uh, will pay any valid claim within 10 days of receiving said claim. At Ryanair, we have learnt a lot about the customer service uh, in the past six months. <laughs> right, okay. Only in the last six months. Interesting. And and the two key things that we want to reassure customers is that if you have a valid claim, it, and it's very black and white in terms of what's valid and what's not, we will pay that claim within 10 days. We're also introducing new digital initiatives for customer service. So if you want to rebook a flight or you want to take a refund, it will be something that you can simply do on the Ryanair app. And we're also going to make the claims forms and claims process much more simplified on the Ryanair website. So um, the amount of monetary compensation you can claim depends on whether your flight was delayed or cancelled, how long is it was delayed for and how far you were flying. Under EU flight delay legislation, passengers who have their flight cancelled are entitled to either A, a full refund, or B, an alternative flight. The legislation also includes reasonable expenses, direct costs incurred from the delay of a flight, such as the cost of staying at an airport hotel or any meals eaten while you're waiting for said alternative flight. 
Um, some of the rules that they've set is that passengers, sh- number one is that passengers should be offered a refund or a replacement flight within seven days. Uh, this may be on a different airline, airport, and all extra costs should be covered by that airline. It must inform you of all next alternatives available. Uh, if your flight is delayed, this is number two, by more than two hours, you're entitled to food and drink. That's interesting. I didn't know that. Mm, yeah. Uh, number three, a three-hour, f- uh, three-hour or more delays qualify for compensation under EU law. Uh, so yeah, so if the airline doesn't have a suitable alternative flight, you must be booked on a rival airline in line with civil aviation authority rules. EU rules state that uh, in the interim, passengers must be offered free of charge a meals and refreshments in a reasonable relation to the waiting time and b hotel accommodation in cases where a stay of one or more nights becomes necessary. Be aware that if you decide to cancel your flight before hearing from Ryanair, you may jeopardise both your rights for compensation and a replacement flight. It's uh, the compensation thresholds that sets here for um obviously the the hour three hour delays mm. but then it obviously the, three hour plus the, yeah yeah the amount of uh, money you'll get back also depends on the length of the flight in kilometers right so obviously if you're going if you're going from here to say lanzarote or tenerife mm. with ryanair where they do fly you obviously be entitled to a, to more money than if you're going from say here to mm. edinburgh um, so I mean, really, I mean, uh, I, I, this may. Uh, also, we're going, I'm going to speak to our BA spokesman here Hello, now, BA. of course. Uh, but <laughs> but uh, I mean, presumably, this is a, a you know something similar that's already in place as far as BA are concerned. How quickly? I mean, are, are they doing it in sort of ten days, or, or are you having to wait the full calendar month before? I think it depends. And actually, I've just noticed that Jenny in the chat room just said that her BA flight was delayed by six hours in January mm. due to weather, but no compensation. But they she did get a free lunch, and I think BA. I've got a bit more flexibility when it comes to these sorts of things. But right. um, it's good to see, though, that uh, Ryanair is sort of stepping up to the mark, isn't it? Because I think this mm. was long overdue, and I think they're trying to be nicer to their customers now. So mm. there's a, yeah, a, a better chance now of, uh, of, of getting yeah. compensation. But true. there is a, a standard thing. I think it's EU 261, isn't it? Something like that. That's, Something uh, like that yeah. there, there is a minimum standard for mm. uh, uh, for delays and, and compensation and food and water and, and that kind of thing. Right. So, uh, yeah, we will yeah. see. Yeah. Seems like they're making some changes, Ryanair. You know, we've covered the story mm. last week yeah. with the, you know, the obviously recognising the Balper, the union. For yeah, you say that though, but there was there and was a, there was a contrary story that was released, um, a sort of like a few days afterwards, where there was now sort of disputes occurring left, right, and centre, and possible mm. strikes, and goodness knows what else. Literally, um, you know, where he was whilst he was recognising pilot unions, he still wasn't doing anything about it. Mm. So I, I, I don't know. I think. Yeah, that's, well, I watch think this that's, space. Yeah, well, indeed, <laughs> indeed. What? P- watch PTUK for no, further details. Further details. Yeah. Mm. So yeah. moving on to the next story then, and uh, unfortunately this week I couldn't find a, 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 nice a decent story. BA story for oh, Nev. Dear. So Nev, I've, uh, I've given you a, a different uh, airline carrier <gasps> this time. Don't worry, I, I don't mind. Um, but it's all about EasyJet. It's on the aviationweek.com. And, uh, of course, uh, they are one of the world's largest low-cost airlines and one of the biggest customers of Airbus. Uh, they recently held a Meet the Neo event at Manchester Airport. The airline already operates over 280 A319 and A320 aircraft over its three European operations, which is the UK, Austria and Switzerland. And in July 2017, it took delivery of the first 100 A a3, uh, sorry, A320 Neos that it had on order. There's some nice pictures of it too. And uh, these planes are all planned to be in service by 2022. And the Neo, which stands for new engine option, doesn't look too different from the outside to the A320CO current engine option except for the larger cfm leap 1a engines and in easyjet's case the large neo letters on the rear fuselage and to be honest it doesn't look too dissimilar on the inside either but then this isn't an aircraft development meant to be a game changer for the passenger but rather for the airlines that operate them with a 15 percent saving on fuel typically an airliner's single bis- biggest expense and a corresponding reduction of 15 percent in carbon emissions coupled with a huge noise reduction of around 50% on takeoff and landing. The A320 Neo family is all about cost saving and environmental impact. Numerous weight saving initiatives include electronic flight bags in the cockpit instead of uh, wads of paper and lightweight Recaro seats. The slim seats allow for an extra row of six seats in the same cabin as older uh, Airbus A320s whilst not diminishing the legroom. Uh, EasyJet uh, uh, operates uh, to over 140 airports in 31 countries 
countries across Europe, the Middle East and North Africa on 880 routes from 28 bases. 800, uh, sorry, 80 million passengers fly on the unmissable orange jets uh, each year, including 3.5 million from Manchester, where 12 aircraft are based. And EasyJet is the largest airline at Manchester, which is the UK's third busiest airport flying to 53 airports in 22 countries. Well, um, I, there's two things about this jet that always fascinate me. The size of these engines mm. and how low the engine pod is to the ground when the aircraft's on the deck. So I'm sure they've worked it all out, but I'm just wondering what that would be like in, in challenging landing conditions <laughs> uh, with the thing rocking from side to side yeah. of it on, on not, the final. Not, not a lot of um, margin also, for error, essentially. Uh, yeah. Being a, a slightly larger chap, have you seen the size of these seats um, <laughs> and, and the width? Uh, that's going to be extremely challenging for uh, people of my sort of size, I would imagine. You wait till mm -hmm. I get on one, Nev. Well, I was not going to go there. I was still, I was Andy, sorry to yeah. say that. It's all right. I, I have two friends next to me who will quite happily go there as far as... <laughs> I was actually going to say the same thing as you, Nev. Looking at the... There's a picture on there of the guy with a with a camera, obviously one of the um, mm, journalists impressive. on this flight. Yeah. And when you look at this, the actual thickness of the backs of the seat backs of these chairs, and the, the, obviously yeah. the new seats, and the, they are incredibly thin. And also, very, the, very some thin. of those uh, aircraft, of course, are going to be used on the, the longer routes, too. So certainly things like um, Manchester to the Canary Islands, that sort of thing. So that's a good four and a half hour flight in, mm. in, in those conditions. So uh, it'll be interesting to see what, what people are like at the end of it. But it just looks a little bit too cramped. And I think certainly when you need back support and, and that kind of thing, they just look a bit thin uh, yeah. for my liking. Yeah, I think there'll be a few numbums. When yeah, they arrive probably. at their destinations, maybe it's you know really fancy new foam, and therefore you don't. Sort of... Well, perhaps, mm. perhaps if I we, mean, technology is if... changing all the time. All, all jokes aside, I mean, you know, they they can perhaps with the same amount of padding that mm. you know they can get more. Com uh, who knows? <laughs> perhaps if uh, if anyone who's listening to the show has flown on the new A three nine twelve three twenty Neo with their EasyJet, give us a, a review on the seat mm. comfort. That'd probably be nice actually to hear from uh, from yeah. that. But uh, moving on to the next story. This one is on the Forbes.com website. Ew. Oh, hello. <laughs> and uh, the headline Singapore Airlines announces world's first Boeing 787 10 route. So Singapore Airlines is the delivery customer of Boeing's next generation 787 10 Dreamliner. The airline will receive the first of the new planes out of a total of an order of 49 on them. And the the, uh, the aircraft manufacturer are going to be delivering these in March this year. Singapore has now announced that the plane's first scheduled destination will be Osaka beginning May the 3rd, 2018. The route from Singapore to Osaka is just over 3,000 miles and clocks in at 6 hours and 15 minutes, giving the travellers plenty of time to test out the jet's bells and whistles. Uh, prior to the launch of the route to Osaka, the airline will fly the 787-10 on select flights to Bangkok and Singapore in order to familiarise crew with its operation. The 787-10 is the largest of Boeing's Dreamliner family, which will also include the 787-8-9, uh, uh, and it's uh, a 68 metre uh, long, which uh, is 5 metres longer than the 787-9 and 11 metres longer than the 787-8. Uh, it has a wingspan of 60 metres and cruises uh, up to a speed of up to uh, 647 miles an hour and has a range of 6,430 nautical miles. Perhaps more interesting for flyers is the fact that Singapore's configuration of the jet will have uh, 337 seats uh, total in, on board, including 301 economy seats and 36 of the airline's new regional business class seats called the Stelia. Hmm. Stelia Opal. <coughs> interesting name for a mm, business okay. class seat. I uh, do you uh, remember Opal Fruits. Oh yeah, Sorry. made to make your mouth water. <laughs> these seats do actually, looking at these. The uh, introduction of the new regional cabin products on the 787-10 is part of the commitment uh, of Singapore to continuously uh, innovate and the, uh, be, become a leader to enhance premium travel experiences for the customers, said Singapore Airlines Vice President of Marketing and Planning, Tan Kai Ping. 
the Stelia sorry, what? Opal seen uh, in a you know, seen on the pictures Matt's put on the screen actually, and uh, is laid out in a one-two-one configuration where uh, each seat has direct aisle access and reclines to a horizontal lie flat seat. A welcome update of Singapore's current recliner and angled lie flat business class seats. The airline has not released which other specific destinations it intends to serve with the Dash 10s. However, uh, given the details so far, it seems likely the plane will be used on other airlines' regional routes within Asia. And also, Singapore are going to use their A350 900s configured with the international seats on ultra long haul routes like those from Singapore to San Francisco, which launched in October. And also, the Los Angeles to New York routes, uh, which the airline indicated will begin flying later in 2018. I must say, those seats do look incredible. Incredibly comfortable, those mm. um, the new seats. Yeah. They do look a bit strange. They do look like they, they take up quite a lot of room as well, yeah. especially the uh, unit with the um, the TV and stuff on. But you sort um, of think that they, they must be a, a, a more space efficient way of doing the of same thing. Having, yeah. yeah, obviously the Without pod's got to be that size for the reclining bed. Mm. But uh, it seems like, mind you, I think there's a, a space to put your feet and everything under there. And right. um, yeah, okay. it looks quite nice. <laughs> I don't think we'll ever be able to afford that somehow. Matt. Really? No. What, what gave that away? No. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Indeed. Who knows? So that? next story, moving on. Uh, so, uh, it's another Ryanair one for you, man. Mm, Kelsey Breeze. So this is on the ajot.com website. And the headline is, Ryanair seeks pilots in South Africa to fly expanding fleet. Uh, Ryanair Holdings PLC is starting a recruitment drive for pilots in South Africa as the budget airline seeks to crew uh, seeks crew to helm its expanding fleet of jets. The Irish carrier will host roadshows in Johannesburg and Cape Town later this month and is looking to hire captains for Boeing 737s, according to an advertisement on its website. Successful candidates will relocate to, to Europe and help staff a uh, 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 help staff a fleet that's expected to increase to 580 planes from around about 425 over the next six years. Airline Pilots Association South Africa is well aware of the hiring effort and will hold off on commenting until Ryanair discloses the terms and conditions of any job offers. Uh, William Rukin smith who's the president of the Johannesburg-based Labour Group, said by text message, despite recent Labour issues, Ryanair is expanding to fill a gap left by failed airlines in Europe, so they would need to recruit in any event, he said. Uh, the search for pilots in far-flung countries such as uh, South Africa become, uh, comes as Dublin-based Ryanair battles with unions in Europe over pay and conditions. While the carrier has reached a deal in the UK, Chief Executive Ma Officer Michael O'Leary warned this week that he's prepared to cope with pilot walkouts rather than compromise the company's low-cost model. Dear. Uh, South African Airways, uh, the country's unprofitable state-owned carrier, is cutting routes as new CEO, I'm not even going to try and say that one out loud, <laughs> seeks to reduce costs. While the majority <laughs> of its fleet is made up of Airbus SE models, it also includes some Boeing 737s. A spokesman for SAA didn't comment uh, to phone calls seeking said mentions. So it seems that we've uh, we've obviously the, there's a, a pilot shortage, yes. as we know through stories we've covered in the past. Indeed, but uh, definitely expanding things to go that far to uh, to find some pilots. Then, I don't all know, the way a small to part South of thinking maybe they should just sort of look after the the what you know look after what you've got already before you start making things but bigger. But anyway, then. remember we know Stuart, our good friend Stuart uh, O'Neill, yes, yeah, yes, yes. who flies the caravan or used to fly yes. the Cessna caravan, who now flies yes. for a regional carrier here yes. in the UK. Mm -hmm. Uh, Stuart actually got his license in South Africa. He did, yeah. Yeah, and um, I remember saying to him not so long back, actually, in regards to, to doing that out in South Africa, and he says it's still incredibly cheap to gain your pilot's license in South Africa. Really? Mm. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm. So uh, perhaps it's a good place to look, I suppose, for uh, for fledgling pilots. What do you think, Nev? I think... The industry always goes through this phase, doesn't it? One minute there's a pilot shortage, the next minute there's too many and there's people being laid off. Um, but there's a gen I think the general consensus of opinion, there is a pilot shortage at the moment. So, uh, And, of course, it's very expensive to um, to, to get trained, isn't it? The mm, long gone yeah. are the days yeah. of uh, sponsorship from uh, the, the, big air, the big airlines. You know, you've now got to take on the equivalent of a of a mortgage, effectively, uh, to pay for your own uh, stuff. Well, and there's and, no, there's uh, no guarantee. 
or go to the bank of mum and dad. Yeah, well, yeah. and I'd say I, I, I know a story. A very uh, kind of sad, really. Um, I won't name name him because uh, I don't think he'd want me to. But uh, he's always wanted to be a pilot, like since you know he, the classic thing. He had pictures up on his bedroom wall and all that kind of thing. And he tried absolutely everything to. I mean, he got a he's got a commercial license, or at least he did have, I should say. Um, and right at the nth hour, he was finally offered a job by EasyJet. I'll, I'll mention them. And then right at the nth hour, they pulled out. And uh, everything lapsed. So the dream literally, because he literally can't afford any more money to to keep it going and sort of think, you know, various um, qualifications that you've got obviously start to lapse and, and he can't afford to, to carry on. So like literally the, the dream is over. Uh, which is so sad when you think they're so desperate for pilots out mm. there mm, that yeah. um, uh, but he can't get, you know, he's sort of hinged everything on finally getting this, this one airline, you know, interested in him. And when it all came to an end... Well, that, don't forget, we had an up-and-coming pilot at the 200s, didn't we, with uh, David, yes. Mr. Corsten. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's, uh, he's busy try, you know, mm. trying to get through the, uh, the various the process. processes. Yeah. 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 Indeed, it's 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 bizarre. You you do think though that if they you know where they are so desperate for um for pilots that there would be some help available. Do you know what I mean? Mm. To actually, you know, if there is this this pilot shortage that everybody keeps going on about, surely, you know, a bit of sim time or whatever to help keep qualifications. I, I, I don't know why they're not sort of willing to dip in their own pockets, if you like, to 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 help out getting people in the air if they're that desperate for pilots. Apparently Liz Piper in the chat room just said, sorry Nev, um, that uh, Air France announced a cadet programme. Did they? That's mm, This week, yeah. yeah. Mm. Sorry Nev, you were going to say? I was just thinking that um, because of the risk of failure as well, uh, of, of mm. people not getting through the, the, the training schemes, I think that's why, I mean apart from the fact that the airlines probably can't afford to do it anyway, but the um, the problem that they've got is, is the, the, the huge cost of training. I mean this stuff mm. is, is not uh, no. without a massive cost and um, they just can't afford to take the risk, I, I would have thought, yeah. and, and that's why all the, all the um, uh, it's very, very onerous as a a cadet pilot to uh, do it but that's the only way to do it obviously mm. you know if you're successful and and you earn good money at the end of it then you know you eventually get to pay it back that's but, fine uh, yeah it's a huge uh, loan to begin with isn't it do you think Nev, if you had a couple of hundred thousand pound laying around a sofa somewhere at home you'd <laughs> you'd, be, you'd like to have a you know go through to you do your training and stuff and i think it's nah. a bit more than that <laughs> No, it's about a hundred thousand, is it? Mm. Well, I, the, my problem is again would would be the the concern about failure. So you've paid all that money, and mm. uh, for for whatever reason, you know, I, I haven't got through the course, or I've been thrown out of the course, or I've, I've not done uh, well enough to to become to get to the next stage. I mean, there's no going back. You know, you have spent the money, and, and mm. that is it. And yeah. um, so, but I'm sure there there will be people that that has happened to. And, of course, uh, it, it's it's a very worrying uh, uh, thing, isn't it? The problem from our point of view as well is now we're kind of at that age now <laughs> where I don't know whether we'd see a return on our investment before Definitely not. The for, end us, of, yeah. for us, you for know. Us. Yeah, it really is <laughs> a, you people. need to be, <laughs> indeed, <laughs> uh, you know, it's a, a genuine issue is like, you know, I mean, you could do it by all means because that's the dream, but whether you'd ever actually get, get your money back, if you like, on, mm. on something like something It's like all that. about winning the lottery. Is it? Yes. Right. Okay. Anyway, moving swiftly on, <laughs> the next story, ne uh, Nev. Yeah, it's on the uh, bizjournals.com, and it's about... Uh, Boeing's decisions on mid-sized 797 aircraft. And uh, Boeing is studying three different engine designs for a new mid-sized passenger airplane dubbed the 797 delegates at the Singapore Air Show heard this week. Uh, the leading contender is GE Aviation through its CFM International Joint Venture, which said Boeing will have to make a decision in 2018 for the potential aircraft to be ready to enter service in 2025. Time is running out, Shaka Shakur, uh, GE Aviation's Vice President and General Manager of Global Sales and Marketing, said at the Singapore Air Show Aviation Leadership Summit, according to Aviation Industry News publication Flight Global. And Flight Global reports that proposals from three major engine makers 
for the new aircraft all differ in technologies. One source of frustration for engine makers is that Boeing has yet to publicly reveal whether it will only have one engine supplier for the aircraft. Boeing took that approach with its 737 MAX jets, which are powered by the GE CFM Leap 1B engines, whereas buyers of the 787 Dreamliner may choose either engines made by GE or British engine maker Rolls-Royce. And GE, the world's biggest jet engine maker, vowed at the 2017 Paris Air Show that it won't enter a three-way turbine production contest for Boeing's mid-sized plane because of a fragmented market would not justify its investment, Bloomberg reported. Uh, should Boeing opt for more than two engine suppliers, we're out, said David Joyce, head of GE Aviation. And in Singapore, GE's Shakur parsed those remarks, saying GE's CFM's decision to join the programme will depend both on Boeing's forecast market size for a 797 combined with the number of engine suppliers involved. Developing a new engine could cost between $2.5 and $3 billion, he said. So so far, Boeing has indicated that it's, in t that it's talked with 50 potential customers about the new mid-size aeroplane. The aircraft will be bigger than its MAX 737 family of single-aisle jets, but smaller than its largest streamliner, the 787-10. And Boeing's senior vice president, Dinesh Kaskar, talked up interest in the 797 jet at the Singapore Air Show, citing potential customers in Australia and India. And Kaskar said uh, Qantas CEO Alan Joyce is already bullish on the jet's prospects, the Australian business traveller reported. Qantas reportedly likes a larger 797, capable of transporting 100 more passengers on its busy but constrained route, like between Sydney and Melbourne, uh, where which the world's second biggest, which is the world's second biggest air corridor. So this is always the thing, isn't it? At these air shows, there's lots of big, th big things talked about, lots of stuff, but uh, not everything makes it into production, mm -hmm. and that's due to customer demand, cost of engineering, cost of parts, currency fluctuations, all sorts of things. So, uh, and of course, th these are massive decisions, aren't they? About uh, uh, who's who's building the engines and, and whether the aircraft's viable. So, mm. uh, we'll have to see. Probably, we'll have to wait till Farnborough Air Show before another. Mm. It's definitely a space, I think, for the seven nine seven. It has mm. to be. A lot of people have said this has to be a completely different rethink. You know, go back to the yeah. drawing board for this aircraft. But also, there is a space for it because you know we've had. We've gone through the numbers. We had seven one seven two seven three seven four seven five. So it is a natural. You know, we have to have a seven nine seven really to complete the, right, uh, the, 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 the circle. full circle. Yeah. Okay. So I've just seen what the, what the next story is, and I'm looking at this with slight nervous <laughs> and trepidation for for what may or may not be about to occur. So good luck, everyone. So uh, the <laughs> next story on the cbsnews.com. Mm. And there is um, a video. Do I dare play it? The, That's the question. Yeah. <laughs> the headline. Uh, are you ready, everyone? No. <laughs> and the headline. You've already been rated 18 on you. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true. Yeah, yeah. The yeah, headline indeed. is Naked Passenger Prompts Alaska Airlines Flight to Return to Anchorage. So, an Alaska Airlines flight to Seattle was forced to return to Anchorage early on Wednesday after a passenger locked himself in the bathroom, took all his clothes off, and refused to follow the crew's instructions. Airport police said. Uh, CBS Anchorage affiliate KTVA TV reports the aircraft returned to Ted Stevens Anchorage International Airport while flying near Prince William Sound. Kate Danluk, a passenger on the flight, told the Associated Press she knew something was wrong because the flight attendants kept going backwards and forward in the aisle and had to put on rubber gloves. Oh. <laughs> Alaska no. Airlines flight 146 from Anchorage to Seattle re returned to Anchorage due to a passenger not following the flight attendant's instructions. While no emergency was declared, the decision was made to return to Anchorage. Alaska Airlines spokesman Tim Thompson said, or Thompson said in an email, "Airport police and FBI." met the aircraft when it landed shortly before 3 a.m. The police came on board, took him out of the back door, said Dunlook, an Anchorage teacher who was taking a green escape to attend a garden show in Seattle. We, well, obviously we needed to know that bit of information. Mm. KTVA posted the video, uh, which Matt just played a little bit of there. 
and uh, it wasn't immediately clear if the man was arrested. The FBI did not return repeated messages to the Associated Press on Wednesday, said. Uh, a spokeswoman for Alaska Airlines attorney said no charges had been filed against the suspect. Um, there was a subject on the aircraft that had barricaded or locked himself in the bathroom or lavatory, uh, a police uh, report said. Her office declined to make her available to speak to uh, AP Online or the, on the direction of the airport manager who didn't uh, return a message either. Well, they didn't really want to talk about this story, did they, really? Let's be honest here. Well, no. Uh, there are 178 passengers on board the flight, and uh, after the uh, incident, uh, reboarded the flight and then took off back to Seattle with just a short delay. Wednesday's incident comes amid an upcoming guilty plea by Alaska Airlines pilot who was accused of flying drunk, and about a month after a man prompted a United Airlines flight diversion to Anchorage because he was smearing feces everywhere, including a couple of bathrooms. Interesting there. <laughs> anyway, so it's safe to say there that uh, there are interesting things that go on on, on board aircraft. And, you and I um, differ greatly on what is considered interesting. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting naked. I mean, you can barely move in an aircraft toilet. To be fair, I mean, yeah. getting naked. I, I is... would, I would certainly struggle to to do exactly <laughs> that to actually take my clothes off in an air in mm. an airport toilet. In an airport, an air, to- air, aircraft toilet, aircraft yeah. toilet. Sorry, yeah. Nev. I'm guessing you've uh, you've not what, had a chance you, to. Um, <laughs> Try this on board a BA flight. <laughs> no, and um, I, well, let's face it. There's not much room. You certainly couldn't swing a cat in there, anyway. But uh, uh, but actually, funnily enough, uh, we might be hearing something later on in the Nev's passenger experience segment <gasps> oh. about, about some some other options in this area, shall uh, we say? Uh, so uh, Miss World at st- 2018. Stay, this is a mile high segment. Yes. <laughs> oh. stay, stay tuned. Oh, oh. oh dear. Oh, oh, a bit hot here. <laughs> <laughs> Getting a bit nervous again all of a sudden. Uh, it's anyway, like, it's, moving. Like, it's like having Captain Al on the show. I'm very nervous. Let's have a quick look <laughs> in the chat room just to make sure no one's... Uh, no one's oh, here we go. Are we set to... Uh, Everyone um, behaving themselves, are they? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Shorty Crosgrove has put, uh, it's too cold in Alaska to be good to be doing that kind of stuff. Good point. Very yes, true. Very good point. And yes. Richard King has quite rightly said, think of the fuel savings if everyone's stripped off. A very good point. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> See, there's always a commercial angle on it. There is. There? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Richard Adams has said that EasyJet would start charging extra for clothes then. Good point. Yeah, 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 yeah very absolutely. true. Because, you know, the additional weight. Yeah. And, of course, uh, Dr. Steph is an angel, according to the chat room. Right, good. Anyway, moving go. on. Uh, moving on swiftly <laughs> okay, to the next so, story. So, uh, Matt, this one's for yeah, you. Yeah, so this story... Bit of a tech one. It is, yeah. It, it, it is on the Travel and Leisure website, travelandleisure.com, and the headline is, New app lets you bid on unsold airline seats at the last minute. So snag a last-minute deal on your dream destination. A new startup is here to reward spontaneous travellers who like to plan trips on a whim, as well as procrastinators. Proca- Procrastinators who tend to purchase their Big airline tickets. I know, I know. Who tend to purchase their airline tickets just days before their desired departure date. Um, so this UK-based air ticket arena, an air ticket distribution platform, launched on the first of February to give last-minute flyers the opportunity to place bids for unsold seats. To play your hand at booking a budget-friendly ticket, download the Air Ticket Arena mobile app on your. Um, My doing that are you right good uh, where are we going anywhere nice uh, on your on your phone and register once your account is verified choose your destination departure and return dates and the number of tickets that you'd like to bid on you will get to choose uh, which of the participating airlines you'd like to fly with so long as they have flights scheduled for that day you can make a bid uh, up to 14 days ahead of your preferred departure date if you want to book a return ticket uh, you can place a second bid up to 14 days from the departure uh, Egypt says so a bit risky so you go away and then you you know sort of have a little bit of a game sort of play roulette see if you get home all right uh, I can't see this working in the world of Nev to be fair <laughs> no I mean I, you know, I, I like a bit of a challenge at the best of time but yes. uh, no I, I kind of need to go somewhere and, and get back you know plus, plus or minus um, an hour of the uh, 
of the book. Time Ideally, back. yes, that's <laughs> always nice. Yes, uh, once you have uh, selected your preferences, you place your bid by entering how much money you are willing to pay for that ticket. The price is in euros, so don't forget to convert the currency to US dollars or or sterling in our case. Uh, for 24 to 48 hours before the scheduled flight, the airline will decide the amount of unsold seats up for sale and the minimum price they are willing to accept for a bid. If a seat is unavailable for the same or less uh, price uh, that you choose, the airline will automatically book your flight and an e-ticket will be delivered to you. Um, yeah, so it's a little bit brave, isn't it? Fair warning, because the app is new, the bugs and kinks are still to be worked out. Signing up for the app is not intuitive. Uh, Carlos seems to be nodding and agreeing there. Um, and uh, if there are no available, no available tickets on that date you want to leave, Air Ticket Arena does not offer alternative times or flights. Still, for choosing your own price, an extra time, the extra time it takes to fiddle with the dates and... Uh, uh, given into your wanderlust is very much worth the effort. The app is currently available on Google Play and will be available on Apple's uh, App Store platform this March. There's also a web-based app, but it's still in beta testing. So that sounds quite interesting. So, so this is unusual, Carlos. Yeah. Your, your hideous platform has received a device before iOS. Who'd have thought that was possible? Mm. Yeah, I wouldn't get too excited, Matt. No. Oh, I, okay. I can see now why the app's got a 3.1 star rating on okay. the app store. Going well, then. Right. Yes. Yeah, okay. so far, I'm, I'm just trying to find a flight to uh, to see Steph, actually. Right. Dr. Steph. Okay. And, um, what, now? Uh, well, any time, actually. Right. Okay. If you could uh, sort of wait till the end of the show, I'd be grateful. Uh, according to the <laughs> app, there's no results found. Okay. Uh, so apparently we can't go to Charlotte. Uh, from from the UK. Okay, good. Um, Will she mind? Um, and it's an incredibly slow app. Is it? Yeah. Right, okay. Perhaps it's because all of our PT UK listeners are all trying to do it as we speak. Yeah. We've it's, crashed it's why, why do system. people come out with these apps when they're, they're not sort of fully bottomed out and, and developed and <laughs> haven't been tested? Ends up using version 0.7 or something. You know, it's just mad, isn't it? Yeah. I well, suppose with any app though, in in their their, their defence, you've got to start somewhere. Hmm. So well, start start with a a, 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 poor, working, a platform right, right, like right. the one Carlos is using just now. <laughs> Uh, anyway, okay. <laughs> Nev, <laughs> moving swiftly on, Nev, mm-hmm. if yes. you can get this up on the uh, MacBook, if that's not crashed. Stop the it. next story. Oh, oh careful. <coughs> uh, Carlos, <laughs> people in glass houses should never throw stones. Uh, oh, <laughs> there we go. Oh. We got there in the end. That was almost uh, Nev, time. the next well story is, yeah. uh, is for you, and it's uh, a bit of a worry for an aircraft we were talking about not so long back. That's right. This is on the Live Mint dot com and um uh no frills airline indigo has grounded three a320 neo neo aircraft due to engine problems according to a senior official at aviation regulator dgca the grounded aircraft are powered by pratt and whitney engines and the move follows a directive from european aviation safety regulator easa the official at directorate general of civil aviation dgca said easa on friday issued an emergency airworthiness di- uh, directive for a320 neo planes fitted with pratt and whitney, whitney pw 1100 engines having a particular serial number the directive came in the wake of instances of the engines in flight shutdowns and rejected takeoffs involving a320 neo family planes the official added airbus has also issued an alert for providing instructions to depair the affected engines and discontinue extended range twin operations for aircraft fitted with affected engines. The DGCA official said Indigo has three such aircraft which have been grounded. Further, the official noted that the uh, latest issue is different from the problems experienced by Indigo's A320neos earlier and those have been addressed. In a statement, Indigo said that it had proactively withdrawn the three A320neo aircraft from service from the 9th of February. A precautionary measure of grounding these three aircraft resulted in cancellations of some of our flights, it said. And according to the airline, the recommendations by Pratt & Whitney as well as EASA are with respect to certain subpopulation of engines uh, with a particular engine configuration. Pratt & Whitney, with the support of Airbus, is in close contact with the airline to address the results of a recent finding related to the issue, it added. Well, I would say about this that the it's good that they've got a you know sort of preemptive thing going on here um because these all these new engines report back stats and things directly Mm. to the manufacturer so they can Mm. probably see things going on before they actually happen and there's 
clearly some instances of, of in-flight difficulties as well. So it's good that they're uh, nipping this in the bud early, I would say. I, I, now, I have a, a small... Uh, you know how we, we, we're big fans of uh, correct, appropriate reporting on oh, yes. various stories and things. Uh, now, I'm I'm not the, the biggest expert when it comes to stuff like this. I'm the first to admit this. But is, is there any obvious uh, minor issues in regard to the photograph they've chosen to to put with this story by any chance? I have a sneaky suspicion that's uh, not the Neo. Yes, that, that's not an EO aircraft, no. is it? No. That's, that's a standard A320, 320. Ju- judging by the size of its engines. Yes. Mm. Oh, dear. Yes. Oh, dear. Mm, dear. Every week. There I'm we definitely go. going to, if I, I, later this year, if I come up with a new segment called uh, Nev's Media Faux Pas. <laughs> oh, yes, that's like going like to be on the list. Yeah. That would be so I'm good. Not be shorter material. Low, not really. so much content. Can you imagine if we had an that. outtakes uh, blooper reel at the end of each year for all the media faux pas yeah. that we <laughs> do? <laughs> that's that's a good idea. I think we'll start work on that, shall we? Yeah. yeah. Right. 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 Okay, good. Okay. So, next story. <laughs> I'm so happy. <laughs> <laughs> the next story uh, is on the flyingmag.com website. Now, this story has a video. Um, which Matt has got to play out. It's quite a disturbing video, actually, if you if you consider what the video is mm-hmm. being uh, filmed from mm-hmm. and where the, the actual from is flying. So uh, the headline then, FAA investigating video of drone flying dangerously close to an airliner. So a dramatic viral video shows a drone encounter with an inbound Frontier Airlines Airbus A320 at Las Vegas McCarran Airport. When uh, when they first came across the video of the drone's encounter with an airliner, a lot of people assumed it was fake or at least impossible to verify as real. Now the FAA confirms it to flying uh, mag that uh, it is a very seriously and very true video. If you can see on the video there now, if you're watching on YouTube, that video is being broadcast or, you, or recorded by a drone, which, judging by the camera angle there, was not that far above that A320. So uh, the FAA take the video very seriously and members of the drone community are coming forward and to say it is 100% real <gasps> and a stupid stunt that tarnishes their whole community. The video originally posted to a drone enthusiast Facebook group by someone called James J.O. Alder who describes himself as a Las Vegas high school student shows the drone quickly climbing to an altitude of at least 1,000 feet a mere seconds before a Frontier Airlines A330, uh, 320 sorry, flies underneath it. Uh, drone are restricted to heights of no more than 400 feet but a custom built racing drone like one of the many drone enthusiasts uh, use was suspect uh, to be used in the uh, particular incident uh, which was in Las Vegas and uh, well it's it's disturbing enough I mean internet sleuths have determined that the drone took off from a parking spot near the Whitney Nessa Nature Reserve about three and a half miles due east of McCarran's runways 25 left and 25 right then it quickly climbed above the flight path of the inbound Frontier jetliner before zeroing in on its flight path with its HD camera the drone comes uh, within a hundred feet or so of the A320 and even its tail number November 210 Foxtrot Roman can clearly be seen in the video. These clues could help investigators determine when the video was shot. Drone industry groups were quick to condemn the drone pilot who faces a world of trouble if he gets caught. Mm, I bet. Older uh, has reportedly confirmed the video is real but says he didn't shoot it and also the FAA spokesman said that the uh, incident is under investigation and if the perpetrator is found the penalty could be as severe as a $250,000 fine and three years in prison. Wow, Uh, well they're taking it seriously then, I'm pleased to say. What what do you think of that video, Nev? Well, now... um, just talking technically just for a moment there is no reason at all why why that video couldn't have embedded uh, metadata in it and so it would know exactly mm. uh, where it yep. was and like a, a mac address on it so the yep. same thing you get out the back of your computer mm-hmm. to prove it's a unique identification yeah the problem is is that you don't know who's flying it no. and um obviously you can have drones registered to 
uh, certain pilots or registered users. But I think it's one of these things now, isn't it? We're, we're operating or they are operating uh, remotely uh, from the from the uh, actual equipment itself. So it's really difficult to, to pin down who is actually responsible yeah. for it. But uh, they've, they've got to do more in this area because um, we well, we keep saying it every week, don't we? Uh, that this is going to be a, a big moment one of these days. See, and uh, p- people have to make uh, make some big decisions, I think. I, I would argue, actually, in some respects, there's, an, there's, there's potential here for... Um, like the first, the person that first posted it online uh, should be the one where the buck stops, unless they can successfully prove otherwise. Mm. There's, here's a here's a crazy, yes. a slightly crazy idea. I know, okay. yeah. I know, it could be logistically a bit, comp- you know, difficult to do it. But this guy who's posted it, so they've obviously tracked it back far enough to have worked out that this was the person responsible for it first appearing online. Although he's denying that he mm. had anything to do with the footage, you know, but he's got to somehow prove, and it wouldn't be too difficult, you know, if they're if they're willing to like, you know, charge you two hundred and fifty thousand pounds and send you to prison for three years, then they're going to be willing to look into your financial records about where you might have bought, say, a drone from a shop, for example. Therefore, it's up to you to prove, you know, successfully, like that you weren't the one. Who posted this video? I mean, I, may, I'm, maybe I'm being a little controversial here. I think that's a very good point, and, and uh, I think people, um, I think the judiciary and you know the people that, that make the rules about um, mm. uh, aviation safety have, have to have uh, some um, b- big big ideas about how they're going to solve this problem because it's just yeah. going to go on and on and I think that um, I'm not sure I mean always I think that the uh, aviation fraternity were always on the back foot with this mm. they, they never got ahead of the game quick enough no. and then suddenly there's incidents in and around the um, uh, the terminal areas of, of airports and, and this kind of stuff but they're, they're, they've really got up their game now I think to, I to think, find ways yeah. of, of finding and, and prosecuting and, and uh, I mean don't get me wrong I'm the first to look at that video footage to think wow Wow, actually, a small part of me thinks that that was amazing. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Because it's a view you wouldn't normally get. But then yeah. at the same time, yeah. you sort of look at that footage and you think that could have so easily been a hideous disaster. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Over yeah, a built-up area as well, don't forget. Yeah. There's all houses below yeah, there. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So if you, I'm not being funny. If you did bring down said... So, and so that, but that was coming into land, so... Mm. You know, it's quite close to the airport. I don't know. There's so many things wrong with that story, Mm. really. Anyway, we're going to move on before I get sued. Uh, And the headline uh, on Forbes.com website this time is new smartphone. So it's not new smartphone app. Now, the A380, we've we've covered several stories where they're perhaps not as easy to to find and get a flight on as as, um, perhaps many would like. Because I know, you know... There, we've run stories where the A380 is perhaps not uh, in service as much as many would like. Uh, but this new app from Airbus makes it easy to find and book A380 flights. Travelling internationally, wouldn't you rather fly in on the comfort of a giant A380? Now a new app, an existing website from Airbus, uh, I fly A380, right... I fly, what? I fly a 380. <laughs> That's quite good. Dear Lord. Uh, <laughs> let, let you, is it I fly? Yeah, I fly, I fly, I fly a 380. A380. Com, uh, will let you find and book a 380 flights. Carlos is on this now. Uh, the uh, Airbus has been marketing the A380, the world's largest air passenger um, aircraft to airlines over the last 15 years with mixed success. New Airbus, uh, now Airbus, is finally marketing directly to the ultimate consumer, the passenger. Many passengers wanted to fly specifically on the A380, but it has become very difficult to know which aircraft you would fly on, says Stephanie Vupo, who is the digital who is the digital Airbus transformation leader. Uh, now it's easy to find A380 flights through this app. The idea is to promote the passenger preference for the <sighs> f- the right you're right there. No, it's a rubbish app because it's, it's only on Rubbishy iOS. Oh dear. Oh, oh dear. Anyway, carry on. <laughs> uh, where did I get to? So, the idea is to promote the passenger preference for the giant plane uh, as the iFlyer A380 <laughs> website puts uh, it. Passengers can fall in love with flying all over again. To help promote this experience, the website and smartphone apps include features from AR to social media as well as inspiring images of world destinations from Abu Dhabi to Zurich. Uh, the target audience is frequent flyers as well as millennials uh, said Airbus digital transformation leader Jeremiah Buskoff uh, the more you 
the more you fly, the more you will like the A380. With the A380, you don't feel the takeoff or landing, and you enjoy the silence and the smoothness of flight. Now, have you flown on an A380? Many times, and, yeah. And would you agree with that statement, that, that uh, it, you don't feel the takeoff and landing? Well, you feel the takeoff and landing, because obviously you know you're taking off and landing. But no, it is incredibly quiet, I will mm. say that, for the A380. Um, yeah. I've, I've flown on Emirates and the, the Qantas um, um, you know, versions of. Um, no, it is quiet. It's comfortable. I will mm. say that. Um, and I think both times I flew with on the 380, um, I probably did book them because it was using the 380. Um, really? Yeah, uh, especially with Emirates. I know the last time we went to Dubai with Emirates, I did look when I was booking to go to try and get back on the 380 again because the options the, you, there are options to go on the triple seven actually to you know to Dubai, but you know just to have a go with the three eighty it's uh, always nice to try. Uh, it's a very beautiful the one largest the British, Airway, the British Airways one I've just yeah. popped up on the old YouTube stream there. But no, they've they've released this app on iOS. Unfortunately, um, they'll release it on a proper platform at some point. But they already have the released future. it on a proper app platform. No, it's not on Android. No, no, <laughs> moving on. Anyway. <laughs> So uh, yeah, I, I mean, Nev, you have you yet to fly on a three eighty, aren't you? Yeah, I've not been on one, and um, I'm trying to find a route which would be good. So I'm. Uh, you can download this app. Yes. Yo, he's well, got he's do. got a decent phone, so I, he can. Yeah. But I think um, <laughs> I'd quite like to do a. Well, actually, uh, there might be an opportunity coming up in June because I'm off Ooh. to Las Vegas for our other trade show that we do there. <clears throat> so mm, let's see if I can you. do at least a, a Heathrow so, to so, LA. So uh, I'm now about I, to literally be the only one that's not been to Las Vegas. Mm, apparently. Yes. Oh. I think you've got to go once at least, yeah. um, and then at that point you'll decide whether you want to go back again. <laughs> I, I, I do quite like it, I have to say. No, yeah. I, I like yeah. it. I enjoyed Vegas. Yeah. I know. I have a feeling that my boss and and Charlotte are not going to like it, but there we are. That's my my mm. personal opinion. They they're going to spend it in a hotel at a trade show. So, but on a stand. But they're not they're not flying a three. They, are they they're flying United. I think are they flying United or no Brie? Thank you. Oh Brie. Brie. Yeah, okay. Okay. Brie. Brie. Or, or BA, if you so prefer. So that would be uh, <laughs> so that will probably be a triple seven. I'd imagine. Oh, I don't to, uh, or to, or a or an A380, probably. Or a Dreamliner. Yeah. Binliner. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah good. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so moving on to our last. Nick would be so proud of me, wouldn't he? Story in the news segment this week. We. We haven't had one for a while, so I thought I'd dig one out of the news Ooh. feeds. And uh, this one uh, came actually online on, well, just towards the end of this week. And uh, we, we haven't done a, a top ten, but we haven't done a food-related item for a while. So before we start, which way round are we going to do it? We're going to start at ten and we'll work our way We'll start at ten. Okay. Right, um, but this go. one is, the story then is on the Forbes.com site. We're going to be, be sponsored by Forbes this week. <laughs> right. uh, Forbes.com oh, website. And uh, the headline is Top Ten Airports for Food okay. in 2018. Uh, figuring out what... Uh, uh, what to eat is often a dreaded task for many air travellers. Between the salty fast food and stress and struggle to finding a seat at an airport, uh, they must fly from Luton, uh, dining isn't typically known for its desirability. Thankfully, there are a number of international airports that offer a great variety of dining experiences at a decent price. To find the best ones, Reward Export or Expert gathered uh, thousands of reviews of airports and businesses across the US and put together the 2018 International Airport Dining Scorecard. So we're going to start off at number 10 then. Um, Nev, do you want to kick off? Yeah, this is uh, Heathrow Airport, London, and the second busiest international airport with more than 75 million travellers in 2016. Heathrow boasts the first, third highest quality in food, thanks to renowned chefs such as Gordon Ramsay. Unsurprisingly, it is also the most expensive, which explains the shock horror in, the in London. Yeah. Yes. Indeed, in at number nine. At number nine, it's Munich Airport in Germany. So like the Adolfo Suarez Madrid Bajaras Airport, the Munich Airport would have ranked a lot higher if not for its pricey dishes at nearly 40% higher than average prices among the 15 airports, the second highest on the list. Munich makes up its with its average number of choices and high-quality food. In at number eight. 
Number eight is Madrid Bajares Airport, and you can count on this airport in Madrid to have some drool-worthy Spanish Ooh. foods and <laughs> <Nice>. tapas. <laughs> uh, but if you're into something else, then uh, sorry, there's not much uh, not much diversity here to re- rival the quality and price. It's new. It's in at number seven. Number seven, it's Kingsford Smith Airport in Sydney, Australia, snatching a perfect score in the diversity department for offering everything from Thai, Mexican and Australian cuisine. The Sydney airport doesn't fare so well when it comes to price, but at least the food tastes great. It's a new entry. It's a bit of a shock. It's number six. <laughs> it's uh, Gatport Airwick. Indeed. Uh, who knew uh, Gatwick <laughs> would have topped Heathrow on the dining front? Although yeah. in terms of quality, Gatwick is 4% lower than its more famous counterpart. The airport's substantially lower price made it number six on the list, which was four higher than Heathrow. Um, number five, Middleford. We're going to ask Nev for some specific comment on this one. So at number five, it's Amsterdam Airport Schiphol. Schiphol. Finally, an airport outside of Asia on the list. Schiphol has a bit of everything, from dining to uh, more budgeted options uh, for different travellers. Price and diversity-wise, the airport scores at the top 50%. However, quality rise, it's 3% shy of the top half of the rankings. Nev, would you agree? Yep. I would agree with that. I think they did a very nice job, and uh, there's plenty of selection for for all tastes there. In at number four. Uh, That's uh, Changi Airport in Singapore, boasting the the most balanced score uh, in terms of the top half of quality, price, and diversity. Singapore's Changi Airport offers a number of authentic quality dining options, among which uh, Cantonese food is its speciality. It's our biggest climber this week. It's number three. At number three, it's Hong Kong International Airport. Lucky for those who travel through Hong Kong International Airport, which are plenty, considering it's the world's third busiest international airport. There's lots of amazing food from Caviar House and Prunier to Crystal Jade La Mian Yao Long Bao. Oh, God. And Lady M coming in early. With 2018, with constantly, uh, (laughs) consistently positive dining reviews here, speak for themselves. It is second in our... Our top ten. It is number two. Sensational pronunciation there from uh, Carlos. <laughs> I know it's award winning, uh, isn't this it? This is the yeah. Taiwan. I see. I even I can't say it. This is in Taipei. <laughs> Taiwan. In Taiwan. That's it. And what this airport lacks uh, in range of choices, it more than makes up for for food quality. Uh, second highest rated and price second lowest. Even if you're here in transit, you'll get to try a number of local Taiwanese dishes that are quick and delicious, such as bubble tea and handmade noodles. Who on earth thought, oh, it, it, let's be honest, who thought for the moment that the star of the show <laughs> as far as pronunciations would go would be Carlos? <laughs> who, who would have thought that was even vaguely possible? Anyway, it is top of the charts. It is our winner this week. It is number one. Uh, number one, it's Narita International Airport in Tokyo, Japan. While not quite as centrally located as Haneda Airport, this famous travel hub is also known for its fantastic selection of Japanese food at a moderate cost. Yakitori, sushi, yundon and tonaksu, you name it, the high quality dining experience at Narita makes it number one on the list by a big margin of nearly 0.7 points higher out of five. I really don't feel very well. Carlos, what is that? Just bravo, Carlos. That's all I can say. That's yeah, very good. good. Absolutely. My Japanese lessons are going down a storm. You're having Japanese lessons. Oh, Dude, dear. you can barely speak English. Why? I know. <laughs> Thanks. Well, always a pleasure. Never a chore. Um, oh, that brings <laughs> our commercial news segment to a close. Hope you all enjoyed that. I'm feeling a bit hungry now. <laughs> yeah, um, I, yeah I, I must admit, I, out of all the dining experiences I've had, I've had mm. I, I must admit the Jamie Oliver restaurant at Stansted Airport was quite good. I'm quite shocked. Yeah, mm. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, yeah. I must well. admit, I had it. I had I, I, I ate at said restaurant in uh, Stratford, and I wasn't overly impressed. No, okay. I've got to be honest, but there we are. Where, uh, where's the best place that you've had a meal? To be fair, never because I mean you do a little bit of reasonable travelling. I'm trying to think. Actually, I'd quite like the Scandinavian airport. So mm. um, Copenhagen, Stockholm, and Oslo are the ones I've been to over the last few years, and uh, they offer very good dining, I must say. And it is a bit expensive, but it, it, I think it's well worth it. Actually, very nice indeed. Well, we're going to move on now before we get into serious trouble because we're talking about food again. <laughs> uh, and it's airport food. <laughs> it is airport. It's food. It's airport yeah, food. Indeed. So uh, uh, Nev, uh, there is only one person who really can introduce uh, the forthcoming next segment 
Well, do you remember a little while ago last year, uh, Dr. Steph told us all about her uh, travels around the world and all the rest of it. And I thought it'd be nice to capture this in one long segment of a Nev's passenger experience. So uh, here she is telling us all about it. Welcome to another in the series of Nev's Passenger Experience. Well, this week I'm speaking to a special guest who has not been shy about spending a few bob on her travels. As many of you know, Dr. Steph is a co-host on the Airline Pilot Guy show, and last year she went on a bit of a jaunt around the world, to put it mildly. She also took in a couple of marathons on the way, as you do. This is quite a long interview as Steph has a great deal to talk about but I think you'll enjoy her tales of her travels and how she was able to bask in some considerable luxury. I began by asking Steph what the purpose of her trip was. Yeah, so this trip was actually a combination of two trips. Um, you know, I do a lot of travel. Um, I enjoy traveling. None of it's for work. Anywhere I go or fly is just for me personally most of the time. And I do a lot of crazy things but certainly never have done a crazy around the world trip. And the only reason this happened was because it was the combination of two trips. First being, um, I decided to go and run the Berlin Marathon with mm -hmm. a friend of mine from, from med school. But anyway, throughout the course of 2017, I was also trying to plan this other trip with different friends from med school, where we have another mutual friend who lives, who was living in Tokyo for all of 2017 and for a few years before that. Um, and we had to see her before the end of the year because her husband was in the Navy and they were moving back to the East Coast of the U.S. They're both physicians, um, so they were trying to arrange their time off of work, and it was hard for them to get the same time off together. They're in different specialties. So the only re the only time they could actually arrange off was, like, the two weeks after the Berlin Marathon. I said, mm -hmm. you guys, that's not going to work out real great. <laughs> I have to be in Berlin. Yeah. And then I said, well, actually, hold on. This, this could work. I'll just ask for, you know, a, a, an extended vacation and I'll just meet you in Tokyo after I go to Berlin. So that's how this all came about. So I actually left Charlotte, went to Berlin, which was kind of a roundabout way of getting there, and we'll get into that in a minute, I'm sure. Um, spent a few days there, ran the marathon, spent a night in London, flew to Tokyo, spent four or five days there, and then back to Charlotte. I think all in all it was 12 days away from home. Yeah, right. And a, and a lap around the world. <laughs> now, you could have done all, all of this uh, on uh, in coach or economy couldn't you if you want I could have I could have and actually there was only one segment of the entire trip that was in coach uh, after I came to my senses because initially I booked the first leg to Berlin uh, in economy because I was just so it's very expensive to get to anywhere in Europe from Charlotte for some reason mm. um, it's just not a usual uh, you know American Airlines kind of has the um, monopoly on anything that's direct so everything else is multiple stops and it tends not to be very very cheap so yeah. I was like heck with it it's the first segment I'm not gonna um, spend a lot of money I can fly an economy that's no big deal well then about two weeks before the trip I had this moment of panic um, <laughs> about flying an economy for for all of that distance because not only was I running the, the Berlin Marathon but two weeks after Berlin, when I was back home, I had to go to Chicago to run the Chicago Marathon. Yeah. And something in my brain just said, that's that's not going to be, you don't want to spend any time cramped in economy if you can help it. So I actually went and changed that ticket and spent a little bit extra money um, to fly business class yeah. to Berlin. And it, so. it just makes such a difference, doesn't it, in, in terms of the oh, re recovery huge, time? Uh, a huge uh, difference. Uh, and what, uh, fl uh, what plane were you on uh, on, the, on that first leg? Yep, so the first leg was actually three flights. Um, and I take it back because one of the first, the very first one was also economy, but it's because it was on a CRJ 200. Yeah. It was an Air Canada regional uh, flight up to Toronto, uh, which was actually very nice. Um, it's the most comfortable CRJ 200 I've ever been on. For mm -hmm. anyone who's listened to me talk in the past, they'll know that that's my least favorite airliner, <laughs> um, jet, small jet. It's, uh, you know, just the placement of the windows is terrible. It's down by your elbow. You can't see anything. Yeah. But this flight was maybe a third full. And the seats were actually fairly comfortable, um, and it was not a terribly long flight, so uh, it was it was a nice experience. Um, it was a little bit crazy because it was a code share because my next two flights were with Turkish Airlines, so I flew from Toronto to Istanbul and then Istanbul to Berlin. So that was mm -hmm. my very roundabout way of getting to yeah. uh, <laughs> Berlin from <laughs> Charlotte. Um, was the most economical at the time, though. But because it was code share, for some reason, when I went to check in for the flight, it wouldn't let me check in for any of it. It said I had to go to the airport and do it. So I got there, and I was able to check in for the Air Canada flight, but they couldn't check me in for the, the Turkish Airlines flights for some reason. 
So when I got to Toronto, I had to actually leave security because no one on the air side of the airport could actually check me in for my Turkish Airlines flight. So I had to go out through security, find the Turkish Airlines counter, oh. explain to them what the problem was. And then it was like talking to two or three different people. So I had, you know, an hour and a half layover in Toronto. Mm. I ate up that entire amount of time just trying to get my boarding pass and then getting back to the gate oh. to board the plane. So I spent <laughs> just, a, you know, it was a whirlwind tour of Toronto Pier yeah, Center. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Ran from one end of the airport to the other, but... Um, but yeah, then the next flight, very nice. Um, my first time flying with Turkish Airlines. It was actually my first time on a triple seven as mm, well. Yeah. Um, you know, their their business class was was very nice. It's not super, f you know, it's not nearly as fancy as some of like the Middle Eastern carriers that we'll talk about in a minute. But yeah. I actually liked the way they had it configured. My seat was actually not direct aisle access, um, but the lady next to me had wanted a window seat as well, so she kept asking the flight attendant after we boarded mm. if there was anything available, and there was, so she actually got up and left. So I had basically a road to myself oh, perfect. Yeah. next to the window. So yeah. it ended up being basically direct aisle access. And, uh, you know, a lot of the business class now, it's all very cocoon-like. You have your own little seats and you don't see anyone else because they've yeah. kind of barricaded you in. Theirs was very open, which was actually kind of nice. It felt very spacious. It felt very roomy. The seats were big. Um, they were comfortable. Um, the food was fantastic. Um, I got off the plane in Istanbul and I was like, well, I can go to the lounge and eat, except I've just had like four meals <laughs> on this nine hour flight. So <laughs> not really yeah. anymore. Yeah. It was really, it was really very nice. I think they did a very good job on Turkish Airlines. Mm, great. So what happened after that? When you got to Berlin, uh, what was your next yep. flight? After yep. That? So took a, a Turkish Airlines A321 to Berlin and um, kind of a older a321 it looked a little tired my um i was still in business class for that and then there was only like two other people in business class for that whole flight so it was very very empty kind of strange i thought my my tray table was broken <laughs> the, oh. the uh, entertainment unit that came out from the armrest also did not keep its uh, it, it wouldn't stay in one place it kept like yeah thing to one side so you had to keep readjusting it i mean these are first world problems right like it's not, not really a big deal in the long run but it just was yeah. like eh, you know not quite the same experience but very nice flight into berlin um so got there spent a couple days there um uh was actually met at the airport by our mutual uh ptuk apg listener fabian so right. that, was, that was nice yeah nice welcoming ran the marathon and immediately after the marathon on yeah, that must have been Sunday. Um, board, went back to the airport and boarded a British Airways flight over to London Heathrow. That's right. Yes, I remember that. So that was a A319, and that was also economy coach. And I fly a lot of um, kind of no-frills flights here in the, the U.S. I, I tend to like Southwest Airlines. I kind of grew up with them, and they're kind of known for being no-frills here. Um, hmm. But, oh, my goodness, that British Airways flight – the lack of space yeah. on the flight, it was very, very cramped. Um, you know, I don't have, that was the only British Airways flight I've ever taken, so I don't really have any other other aircraft to some, compare some it to. Some of the A319s that they run do have uh, some very tight seat configuration. Not not all of them, uh, but some of them do, and I think it sounds that like you were probably on one of those. Uh, which yeah, I mean, I'm 5'7", I'm so I'm not short but i'm not exceptionally tall yeah. and most of my height is kind of in my torso so i usually don't have problems with my knees being you know cramped up into my chest or anything mm -hmm. like that um but i actually have a picture that i'm looking at right now where you can see there's like you know two inches of space between my knees and the seat in yeah. front of me so it was and i just remember the seats not being terribly comfortable it was, it was a short flight and it was it was perfectly fine i mean there was nothing i don't have anything otherwise negative to say about british mm -hmm. airways the service was good and it was it was efficient it was just it was just crowded. Yeah, a little I, I bet. Yeah, absolutely. So then we met up for a curry with Adam and Pip uh, on the we Sunday did. night, Thank which you, was great. And then you were off again uh, on the That's Monday good. morning, weren't you? Monday morning, yes. Um, so this was my flight to Tokyo, and this was with Etihad. And we had a stopover in Abu Dhabi on the way. So the first flight was on an A380. Second flight was on a Dreamliner 787. Okay. Uh, so I've been on the A380 before. I flew with Emirates um, from JFK to Dubai one time in uh, business class, which was a significant upgrade for us at the time then. And I was very much looking forward to my business class flight with Etihad. Um, you know, just thinking back to Middle Eastern carriers yeah. and the nice job they do with some of the, the luxury stuff. And I had an email from them a couple of days before the flight um, with an offer to upgrade to first class. 
And I hadn't seen this before, but I guess a lot of airlines are doing it this way now where it's kind of a bidding process where mm-hmm. you can offer a certain amount of money for the, it starts, I mean, they don't just let you bid with like $1, you know, or one pound. They you give you a sensible starting point, I guess. Yeah, yeah. They give you a starting point. <laughs> yeah. So I was like, well, I'll give them the minimum. I'll, I'll put mm-hmm. that in as my bid. And if it, you know, if there's, if it works out, that'll be fun. And I'm out a little bit more money, but it'd be nice to have a first class seat. Yeah. And if not, I've still got a business class seat and it doesn't cost me anything. So I ended up getting that first class upgrade. Um, which really wasn't a terrible deal. I don't think it was 700 and something pounds extra oh. for the first class seat. It was close to a thousand U S dollars. Um, but for a seven hour flight, um, not, not terrible. Yeah. I would agree with that. So I think up in, in first class, there's actually only nine first class, uh, seats and oh. they call them apartments, which yeah. is pretty suitably named because it's, it's a large amount of space. Mm. You know, imagine the A380 and there's really only one seat on either side of the aisle. There's really kind of two the way they've they've done it, but um, there's, there's just one aisle down the middle and the seats on either side. So you've got a lot of space, a lot of width, but then also a lot of length in the seat. I think there were three windows that I had just to myself in that apartment, and a nice big plush seat for takeoff and landing, and kind of a lounge seat to relax in that actually folded out into a, a bed. I think the bed was longer than six feet, so you know a decent size bed that they would come and make up for you and and pillows and comforters and everything yeah. um you know you get on the flight and the the chef comes by and he says well what time would you like your meal and what would you like to order it's not just what do you want it's <laughs> when do you want it so yeah. you can specify times for all of that if you know what you want to do during the flight you know take a nap watch tv if you're hungry or not um so it was very nice and then they come by and they say well what time uh, would you like to book the shower <laughs> you go oh the shower <laughs> So, yeah, I, I booked a time. I was like, well, you know, I, I thought about it for a minute. I said about probably an hour and a half before we are due to land, I think would be reasonable because um, I had another nine-hour flight immediately after my seven-hour, seven-plus-hour mm. flight to Abu Dhabi. I was like, well, it would be nice to, to grab a little shower and refresh a little bit and and go on from there. So I, it's, not a, it's not a large space, but, I mean, it's pretty incredible that there's – a shower on an aircraft in the first place. And how um, does it work? I mean, do, do you get the, the full pressure that you might get at home? For, for yeah, it really, it really wasn't, um, it wasn't bad. So you are limited to five minutes. Hmm. There's a timer. It actually will, will count down. Um, but you can start and stop the water. Oh, so, right. it, you know, you can kind of stretch it out. And it's, it was nice warm water. It wasn't cold or anything. So uh, standing there for a minute without the water running wasn't, wasn't terrible. Um, you know, they pl- provide all your um, toiletries and whatnot, of mm. course. No, it was, it was really nice. It made a huge difference. It really did. Yeah, so just a, a quick five-minute shower. Yeah. And then you took the Dreamliner uh, from there to Tokyo, I guess. Exactly. Yep. Uh, and we – go ahead. I was just going to say, and, and what about the reduced cabin uh, pressure in uh, the Dreamliner? How much of a difference would you say that it made for you? You know, I I know everyone's talked about that, and I really was trying to pay attention to it, and I don't know that I really noticed a big difference, um, you know, just comparing those two flights in general, because they were both very comfortable. Um, I will say that I slept for most of that flight and had no problem whatsoever sleeping. I did not wake up feeling kind of dehydrated mm. and, you know, when your skin's dry and you just yeah. don't feel real great after you sleep on an air, airplane sometimes. Um so I didn't really have that sense, so I think that probably did make a big difference there. And it really was easy to, yeah. to sleep and, and nap, and I, I did get to Tokyo very refreshed. You know, we left at like, I forget, 11-something at night from Abu Dhabi and arrived at 12.30, 1 o'clock the mm. next afternoon yeah. in Tokyo. I certainly and found when I, when I flew from Washington, Dallas to Heathrow uh, on the overnight flight on a United Dreamliner, it, it, it's the usual thing, you know, you get to Heathrow at 7 in the morning and you just feel horrible. And I have yeah, to say, I, I didn't, didn't over. feel too bad, but more importantly, it was during the, the rest of the day. I actually had an entirely normal day, uh, yep. I think, back at home or work, and I didn't have to go to bed at, you know, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, so from that point of view, I, I found it uh, quite refreshing i'd have to say yeah i mean i I really was able to hit the ground running in in tokyo i had a whole bunch of instructions that i had to follow that my friend had given me because i was uh, we timed it pretty well where i was landing at almost the same time as my other two friends who were traveling Mm. from basically the boston area of the u.s so they they actually i think went to toronto connected there and took an air canada flight over to haneda 
I landed in Narita, which is the complete wrong side of Tokyo from where my friend lives. <laughs> so she gave me all these instructions because she was going to the airport to pick up my other two friends. Uh -huh. So I was kind of on my own to get to her house. So she said, you know, line up for this. Uh, you'll, you'll, when you leave Immigration and Customs, you'll see all the bus counters. Line up at this bus counter. It's got this color awning, not the other color <laughs> awning, this one. She's like, when you get to the front, just say Sagami Ono Eki, which means Sagami Ono Station. <laughs> you want to go to that train station, but you have to get there on the bus. And it was it was really efficient, and it, it worked great. I only managed to take one wrong train in the entire journey trying that to get to her bus. very good. When I went yes. to Narita, uh, I noticed very quickly that after I got the bus into the city centre, into Tokyo, uh, all the um, English signs disappeared. Disappeared. Very, yes. very quickly yeah. indeed. Well, and, and the train station that I went to initially, I had to go to a train station and then take just one train, you know, a couple stops further to where she, you know, the town that she lived in. Mm. And she told me which platform to get on and everything. She's like, all of the trains on that platform go to this, go to the station that you need to be at for my house. One's an express train, one's not an express train. But she was really good because she actually listed the stops that I would make if I was not on the express train. That's good. So yeah. I found the right platform. I got on the train. I didn't bother to read the signs. They did come up in English every once in a while, but there was like a delay. And I was like, well, I don't know. She told me every train goes to the right place. Yeah. And... Uh, <laughs> got oh. on the train and I was looking at the first stop and I'm like that's not on the list <laughs> and she goes oh I forgot there is one I was like okay no problem <laughs> just right. go back to the main station try it again so how long did you spend in Tokyo then before you left? it was there just about five days hmm. four or five days so enough time to see a lot of the city and, and hang out with them and, and do a couple different things so yeah it was really nice fantastic and then from Tokyo did you get a direct flight back to the US uh, I did. I've actually, so I arrived um, from Abu Dhabi in Narita, but I flew out from Haneda hmm. on American Airlines, 777-200 to LAX. Yeah. And yeah. then a, I think it was an A321 back to Charlotte. Hmm. Yeah. So not, not too bad. You know, it's one of those, you cross the date line going that direction. So yes. I left Tokyo at 4 p.m. and arrived at LAX at 10 a.m. on the same day. So, and then I arrived back in Charlotte at 6 p.m., which was only two hours after I left Tokyo. So. Yeah, fantastic. <laughs> well, um, in terms of the um, uh, the quality of service and everything that you received when, when you did the flights, would you say that it was the, the Middle Eastern carriers that were, were really the outstanding? Yeah, they, they're really the ones that, that shine, and it probably had a lot to do with being in, in first class, too, because, uh, I mean, the whole time I was on that flight, I think there were two flight attendants who were taking care of each Right. cabin yeah. or, or seat yeah. so it was a lot of i mean it, you could have as much attention as you wanted or as little to, and oh. they weren't going to to be overbearing with it and it was i mean just very professional and and courteous and uh, always had a smile on their faces you know whether that's genuine or not i don't know but it mm. really does make a difference yeah. as opposed to you know kind of Oh, that's we'll fine. Yeah, absolutely, and absolutely brilliant, isn't it? But, um, and how did you feel when you got back? Uh, did you have to go straight back to work, or did you have any uh, recovery time? <laughs> I went back to work. <laughs> I went back to work on Monday. I was back on Sunday. Went back to work Ooh. on Monday, and then I left on Friday to go back to Chicago for the other marathon. Right. So, yeah, I actually, I did fine. And I, I, you know, I think a lot of it was just the way that I planned the trip, and I think doing the business class was made made all the difference because yeah. I really did get a chance to sleep. Um, I think if I hadn't been able to sleep on those flights, it would have been a completely different story. And I'm pretty good at sleeping on airplanes in general, but uh, it, it really does make a difference to have a lie flat bed. Yeah, absolutely. So. And do you think, uh, one of the things I was going to ask you is in terms of the, uh, you mentioned it earlier on, in terms of the amount of food and, and drink that you could consume if, if you wanted to, do you think, uh, and I know that they, there's obviously a premium to pay for the business class or, or the first class fares, but do you think they offer you too much food, uh, really, on, on some I of I thought Turkish Airlines may have offered too much food. I mean, I really, by the time I got to Istanbul, I was like, I can't eat anything else. This is a little ridiculous. Yeah. It was all very good. Um, you know, I felt, if any, I, Certainly you don't feel pressure to continue eating or, or um, that you have to order something, but you kind of, you know, when it's a trip for fun, a trip for leisure, yeah. you, you want to sample what they have to offer and it all looks good, you yeah. know. <laughs> yeah. um, it's like, yeah, I'll have the tomato soup and the salmon and the butternut squash soup and the duck and the, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, whatever you have to offer. So um, it, it was a lot of food, though. Um, more so on Turkish Airlines than any of the other airlines. I thought Etihad actually had very reasonable portions. Hmm. Um, it almost looks, it, it's, and maybe it's just to my American eyes, you look at the 
I think it was the duck that I had on on their flight. It looks tiny, like it's this little, you know, like medallion of yeah. of meat, yeah. a little bit of veg uh, next to it, and uh, it's like, is that going to be enough? And it's it's plenty. It's it's more than enough. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, but uh, just used to seeing like you know gigantic portions of yeah, steak and of course yeah everything and um would you do it again in, t- in terms oh, of, abs- of, uh, of how, how you traveled and, and the way that you traveled yeah absolutely i mean you know like i said i do a lot of travel but this was a little bit unusual but for me this is about as fun as it gets you know you get to go all the way around the world you get to see different cultures you get to experience different things you get to even the flying is is fun for me i enjoy the the flights um I mean, that's probably not a huge surprise. I'm a huge av geek, but, uh, you know, different aircraft, different um, different carriers, different service, um, just seeing how it all comes together. And, and overall, this was, everything was very positive. I didn't have one bad flight out of the bunch here. So it was, well, it's, it was uh, great. Brilliant, Steph. And thanks ever so much for sharing your insight with us today. Oh, my pleasure. this and other great shows at the Aviation Media Network. The Voices in Your Head dot com. The Plane Talking UK podcast is a voluntary project that aims to keep you informed with the latest aviation related stories from news buyers across the globe. Producing our content does cost money though. If you enjoy our show, why not help us keep on the air by making a donation towards the server and website hosting fees through PayPal. Any contributions would be greatly appreciated. Are you an Amazon user? If so, why not do your shopping through the link on our website? There's no cost to yourself and Amazon pay us a small referral fee on qualifying purchases. To find out more about the show and to meet the team, take yourself to our website www.plaintalkinguk.com or find us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash plaintalkinguk on Twitter via at plaintalkinguk or get in touch via email on podcast at plaintalkinguk.com Thanks Thanks for for listening. listening. Fly B5823 Trent Dane for 23R Manchester Wizz Air 6X Client Flight Level 210 Direct to Britain's Park United, one, two, three, maintain two, eight, zero knots. ever wondered what it would be like to fly a commercial passenger jet? Looked up at the sky and thought, I wish that was me? Well, now anyone has the chance to have a go at flying in a real aircraft simulator. NP Simulations and Flight Experience London, the only official Boeing licensed product of its kind in the UK, offer you the chance to fly anywhere in the world in their fixed base Boeing 737-800 flight simulator. And that's not all. Ground School London offers many different courses for the up-and-coming pilot looking for a start in aviation. With prices starting at just £109, the sky's the limit. So for the ultimate flight simulator experience or engaging preparatory courses, including those for schools and colleges, check out the websites at www.london.flightexperience.co.uk and www.groundschoollondon.com or call on 020 300 40 616. NP Simulations. Fly your dreams. Up a bit. Up a bit. Ah, well <laughs> done, Nev. As always, a incredibly sterling performance there from you Indeed. and Dr. Steph. Indeed. Well, it was, I was just asking the questions, really. But, uh, yeah, Steph, it was great to hear her relive her, her trip there. And, as I said in the, in the interview there, she was in some considerable luxury. And it's really nice to hear all about that sort of stuff because most of it can only, most of us can only dream about. Only, that literally but, only uh, dream uh, of doing <laughs> such mm, things. But, uh, yeah, what, what brilliant facilities are on, on those Middle Eastern carriers, especially the shower. I know, I know. It's, it's such a simple thing, you know. We we we, we do, you know. Every, every I'd like to think most of us, you know, shower at least once a day, um, <laughs> you know. But the idea of doing it in the in the air, I don't know. There's something kind of, I don't know. There's something kind of cool about that, really, isn't there? I oh, know that is good. That is good, indeed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there is quite a lot of room in then showers as well. To be fair, mm. yeah. A lot of people think now a bit 
a bit cosy, but, but, but they are. Yeah, they're really, really, case, yeah, really good. And thank you, of course, Dr. Steph, for uh, for your your time. Yes, let's, let's thank you, Dr. Steph. That. Absolutely, uh, really good. Uh, really, really enjoyed that. So, listen, guys, uh, just something I just want to discuss uh, with everybody because uh, off the back of the two hundredth, we had a uh, like a long chat with a lot of people there, uh, and there was a lot of interest in us is trying to put together a sort of summer meetup. Mm. So I, I'm sort of going to throw a date out there, really, uh, for people to start putting in their diary. I love dates. Make, do you? No, mm. not the edible kind. I no. meant like one you put in your diary. Okay. Uh, and and so I've got so, some at home. Right. Um, Somebody, okay. somebody, help me, please. <laughs> uh, this is uh, so, so. Basically, Saturday the nineteenth of August. Uh, I don't know what how you're fixed, uh, Senev, um, but we're going to try and uh, arrange a bit of a fly-in. Uh, at uh, one of our local airports. So we're not 100% sure which airport it is yet. More details will be forthcoming in regard to that. But at this stage, we just wanted to get uh, the date out there and see if perhaps, because uh, it's I know it's a little way away yet, but I know how much people get booked up, if you see what I mean. Mm. So we're looking at uh, trying to arrange something on the summer Saturday. Summer meet uh, A summer meet-up on Saturday mm. the 19th of August. You wait, Nev's going to look in his diary and say, I'm sorry, I'm going to be in out of oh, Mongolia I mean, then. I mean, and, uh, the thing I would say is it's Saturday the 18th of August is, is it is, is the date according to Microsoft <laughs> <laughs> is <laughs> it anyway. okay uh, all right uh, okay just Why putting don't... it out there um, but it... uh, no uh, that is clear in my diary have so really um, oh. yes have I really Looking... made that terrible terrible mistake oh, <laughs> oh dear yeah uh, you that... see and this is the moral of this story is never do anything from memory uh, no. <laughs> sorry what's your name again yeah, yeah indeed Dave <clears throat> oh it is indeed the 18th yes not the, not the yeah, right good uh, anyway, so so let, shall I scrap that and start that all over again? So, uh, so ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> if you wouldn't mind putting in your diary a fascinating date, it is the 18th Saturday, uh, Saturday the 18th of August. Sorry about that. Well spotted, Nev. Obviously, mm. we can always rely oh. on Nev for um, you know marvelousness. Uh, yes. So, uh, if if there isn't anything in your diary, then please fill it in. Uh, if you can fly in, that would be amazing. Uh, otherwise, feel free to join us down here. So, but we're we're going to have a go. I know we are literally at the arse end of of, of East Anglia. There's no two ways about. <laughs> that we yeah. are uh, you know Nev knows the trip very familiarly sadly don't, <laughs> don't you sir but uh, maybe maybe we can maybe we can arrange a lift for you to come via um, some kind oh, of yes. uh, my, my some... local GA yeah. uh, airfield of course That's of nice. course yeah. Yeah. wouldn't that be nice yes yeah, so yes. Uh, so if Good anybody's idea. willing to sort of swing by and pick Nev up I'm sure he'd be eternally grateful but uh, mm. yeah okay. so seriously Saturday the 18th of August stick that in your diary um, we'll do a live show obviously from whichever airfield it is we end up in uh, and uh, and sort of take it from there but mm, um, yeah good. so Saturday the 18th of August stick that yeah. in your diary so uh, we're going to have one last little uh, piece of the segment for the show anyway this is uh, what we normally do on the run up towards the air show season which was go is going to start very soon it is. and uh, it's just a run through really of the air shows that are up and coming mm. uh, in April uh, which is when everything kind of starts here in the UK. So uh, starting off uh, on the, well, Friday the 30th of March and to the 1st of April on a Sunday, it's the Easter Royal Air Force Celebration uh, Weekend at Cotswold Airport. That's uh, Cotswold uh, Airport in Kemble, Gloucestershire. Uh, they're going to have uh, an Easter weekend uh, with uh, loads of aircraft uh, on display and also with the, celebrating the Royal Air Force's 100th birthday day as well there and uh, following on from that on the Sunday the 1st as well there's going to be one for uh, people who live near Essex the Stow Marie's I think that's how you say that the Royal Air Force 100th celebration at the aerodrome at Stow Marie's at Pearly Essex as well uh, Nev what else we got in April uh, it's a good question, and uh, unfortunately, my <laughs> my computer is not playing ball at the moment with regard to uh, the. Okay. Thing. So, well, uh, I don't know if you can. Uh, I'll I'll take on the there. on my Windows computer. I'll take the rest of these. Oh, uh, and dear. on the uh, Sunday, the eighth of April. <laughs> you realise I'm going to play this back uh, to you next time your, your computer dies, don't you? On Sunday the 8th of April, it's the Auster 80th anniversary fly-in. That's uh, at the Museum of Army Flying Middle Wallop in Hampshire. I beg your pardon. I know. That's <laughs> a good club. That's the uh, it's association with the International Auster Club, the uh, Museum of Flying Army and the Army Air Corps. And they're going to have uh, their 80th anniversary of Taylor Craft Aeroplanes uh, Limited, the iconic 
Auster Air Observation Post AOP aircraft. Uh, they're going to have a day there with loads of stuff happening. And then on the 29th of April at Old Buckingham uh, Airfield in Norfolk, here, mm-hmm. not far from us, uh, they're going to have the Wings and Wheels show. Good show, actually, uh, isn't it? And yeah. that's uh, Old Buckingham. That's where me and Matt uh, and Owen were. Oh, back in the summertime, town mm, end of summertime right, yeah. last year mm. for the Old Buckingham Air Show. But they're going to have a Wings and Wheels Day. There's going to be uh, a few aircraft on display or flying in displays and loads of uh, of old antique cars as well. But we're, we're all there to see the aircraft. We don't care about cars. Indeed. Absolutely. Um, but loads more to come in the, uh, well, in the rest of 2018. Mm. Loads more air shows to come. Uh, later on in the year, we're obviously going to uh, let everyone know what air shows me, Matt, and Nev will be attending uh, throughout the UK. Indeed. Uh, we're probably going to hopefully we'll probably all be at Farnborough this year mm-hmm. fingers crossed and uh, hopefully I think we might be making a move over to to Rhea hopefully as well again this year indeed indeed uh, uh, don't worry Nev I've got a way of getting him back by the way for his uh, his comments just a, about... a point of order though oh, uh, yeah. I thought just for a change I would actually run the uh, Windows partition on, on the Mac and it was actually that that failed uh, <laughs> rather than the Mac itself obviously. very good actually to say uh, this is actually I'm just going to play a little something here I suddenly remembered when he when he's being cheeky him over there about his <laughs> about his various machines there was a um, obviously we had our 200th not that long ago and I dug this out especially to play out our 100th and then because uh, everything was all going horribly wrong I, I never actually did it 100th so I, 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 what, what, and you've been, you've been exceedingly brave as well yeah definitely oh, I don't want to drag me out here but I actually quite enjoy stuff like this it's fine oh, yeah. good 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 can I borrow for the weekend <laughs> <laughs> just, just, just for aviation purposes obviously yeah. <laughs> oh dear! See, I have an amazing way. Of, you see, you should be very careful, sir. Mm. <laughs> you, when you know when you start taking, I'm going to keep that up my sleeve now for every time. <laughs> oh, anyway, moving yeah, so, on, we're yeah. going to close up the show. <laughs> oh, we, oh no, I'm having so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> it did, oh, yeah. Mr. Smith, I know he's going to. Oh, I love thee. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we're going to say a big yeah. thanks to everyone who's joined us in the live chat room today. Loads and loads of people who've uh, given up their Saturday afternoon to join us. Uh, uh, in the live chat room today. Matt, where can everyone find out more about the show? Loads of places to do that. It is www.plaintalkinguk.com is the website. If you want to get in touch with the show uh, using social media, it's facebook.com forward slash UK, and of course it is at UK on Twitter. Don't forget also if you please do send in your audio feedback, we'd love to receive it from you. It is podcast at plaintalkinguk.com and don't forget as well, on the website, you can click on a link on there, the store, and you can purchase yourself a lovely Plain Talking UK t-shirt. Mm. We ship them all around the world, mm. and uh, if you want to grab yourself one of our PTUK t-shirts in the nice sky blue colour, they are 100% cotton t-shirts with lovely embroidered logos, and uh, you can uh, sport one of those in your uh, in your local uh, airfield. New for 2018, by the way, uh, coming up very shortly, there is going to be a range of uh, mugs that will be available so uh, you've probably seen them when we were last in the uh, in in the PT UK kitchen studio um, and we're going to hopefully get those ready to to sell uh, new for 2018 Ooh. is our our marvelous mugs there you go you heard it here first on episode 203 mm-hmm. so uh, Nev I'm going to say a huge thanks to you for joining us as always uh, this afternoon yeah, pleasure, guys, and uh, great to see you again. And uh, <clears throat> should be back on uh, normal time, I guess, coming up this Friday. I yeah, that's Friday. The plan. Yeah, no, yeah. Back to yeah. a Friday show, I think. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Uh, so thanks to everyone again in the chat room for joining us and also not forgetting as well, everyone who downloads the show each week mm. via iTunes and all the other podcast platforms around the globe. Thanks for downloading the show and uh, listening to us uh, us crazy folks here Indeed. on the PTUK Indeed. show. So that is where we bring episode number 203 to a close of the Plain Talking UK podcast. Uh, look for us again next Friday, back on the usual show PM, slot yep. time. Um, so that's it really from here in the barn studio. Me and Matt are going to wish you a goodbye. And Nev? Yeah, see you guys. Take care. Have a nice week. Bye. Bye.